Okay. So this is the second to last class. Top of the class. So we're going to discuss loving God. Now, because these are topics in Chassidus, we're going to be obviously discussing loving God from the perspective of Chassidus. Um, there is an encyclopedia of Chabad Chassidus. It's in Hebrew. It currently has eight volumes. That's a lot. Well, they're up to the word Achdus Hashem. It starts with an Aleph. Yeah. <laughs> so, Fortunately, there is an entry for Ahava, which is love. And an entry for Ahava Sashem, love of God. Those two make up about, I think together, about half a volume. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so there's a lot that Chassidus has to say on love, just in general, as a, as a quality of the human experience, and then loving Hashem, loving God in particular. And if, I am obviously not going to cover everything. What we're going to do is we're going to divide the class into two. The first part of the class, we're going to talk about how Hasidus views love, Ahava, in Hebrew. And then in the second part, we'll talk about one of the many ways of loving Hashem. Okay? So how it views love in general? What? So we're going to talk about, about how Hasidus understands love in general. The first thing is that Hasidus understands love. I'm going to start this way. Hasidus understands, generally speaking, love is not a selfish thing. That's our starting point. Now, can we use the term love or ahava in a borrowed sense to refer to selfish things? We can. Right? We, 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 we borrow terminology from one subject to another, but strictly speaking, we're talking about what, what ahava, what love really is. It is by definition, or not a part of its definition, that is not selfish. So let me give a definition of selfish. Selfish is prioritizing myself at the expense of another. And we can add, if we want to be more particular, unjustly so. Yes? Does that make sense? If you are prioritizing yourself at the expense of another, if that's happening in your relationship to the other, then Hasidus would not consider that to be real ahava, real love. It may have some of the external trappings of love, but it is not love. Okay. Why? The... One of the things that Chassidus says about love is that love is infinite. What I mean by that is that love never dies. It continues to go on forever. Now, that's not the same thing as saying that nothing can ever stop love. Right? So then if you imagine you have a river, and the river flows and flows and flows and flows and flows, um, and the river would never dry up. So in that sense, we could say the river is infinite. It would, never, it would never dry up. But that doesn't mean you couldn't put a dam there and block the river, right? So things can come along and, and put an end to the love, put an end to the ahava. But the Ava itself, it's real love, it will, never, it will never end on its own accord. Um, this is a disturbing thought if you take Chassidus' word at it, because if you now think about all the different things and people you love and ask yourself, if you just kind of let that feeling, that sense kind of run its natural course, would eventually run out? And many of the things that we so think that we love would in fact, we wouldn't necessarily feel that way anymore if we just keep going in that feeling. A simple example is this with food, right? If someone has a desire to eat food, and what happens? They eat, they eat the food, and what happens with the desire to eat the food? It's gone. For now. Right, it goes away, right? Right. It was fulfilling, like, fulfilling the desire, right? Like, letting that desire for the food have full unbridled expression actually ends up killing it. Make sense? So why is that not the way it is with Ahava? So to understand that, we need to break Ahava down. Um, and what I'm describing is, is generally true about, about love. It's not always true, but it's generally true. 
Ava has a few different parts, and to understand those parts, we use an analogy in Chassidus. Um, in general, when Chassidus uses analogies, the analogies are to help us understand things conceptually. They're not meant to be like motivational, inspirational analogies, generally speaking. The so analogy is that there's a fire, and there's a person who wants to put the fire out. So he grabs a nearby container of clear liquid and pours it on the fire with what intention? To put out the fire. But the clear liquid that he pours is not water. The clear liquid that he pours on the fire is gasoline. So now what happens? It's burning. It's bigger fire. So he reaches for more of the same clear liquid, pours that on the fire with the intent of putting it out, and it gets even worse. It gets even worse. Now, absent physical limitations, at what, time, at what point does this process end? If for some strange reason, the man is convinced, irrationally so, that the best way to put out the fire is to pour gasoline, and he keeps pouring gasoline on the fire, and the fire keeps getting bigger. It'll never end. It'll never end, right? So, right. so this, this analogy is an analogy for the, the internal dynamics of how Ahava, how love works. So now what we need to do is we need to break apart, understand what each thing represents. Okay. So let's start with the obvious thing. The man desires to put out the fire. Right? Mm-hmm. What is that in the corollary with love? The corollary with love is a desire for closeness. So, the the desire to put out the fire corresponds to a desire for closeness with the beloved. Right? Good? What is pouring the gasoline on the fire? It's the things that one does to attain, to achieve closeness. Right? If after all, if he's putting out, if he's pouring the gasoline on the fire to put out the fire, the desire to put out the fire corresponds to the desire to achieve closeness. So then the action taken is something that you do to try and achieve closeness. Good? Okay. What is the fire? I thought we just said fire was achieving closeness. No. The desire, the desire to put out the fire is the desire for closeness. Pouring the gasoline on the fire is the things you do in order to achieve closeness. Fire is the person you love? No. Fire is the closeness. Fire is the closeness and the desire for closeness. Let me go back to the, what you think. When a person wants to put out the fire, why do they want to put out the fire? Because they feel like this is something that needs to be addressed, right? When a person feels close to somebody and it's a genuine feeling of closeness, the feeling of closeness prompts them to feel like they need to be closer. So you've got the fire, which is a certain level of closeness that makes you feel like you need to be closer. So the fire, the guy wants to put out the fire. But putting out, not that you want to get rid like the analogy is not you want to put it, get rid of the closeness. But then what happens? You do things to get closer. What happens when you get closer? The fire, fire gets bigger. Stronger. So now you're moving more stronger instead of put out the fire. What happens when you do things to get closer? You're closer. Now that you're closer, what do you feel a stronger need for? Let's get closer. So then you do things to get closer. Which point? You're closer, so now you feel a stronger need. To get closer. You see how this is not going to end? Yeah. Right. That's the dynamic, right? Now, is there something like fundamentally irrational then? But why wouldn't your analogy be about wanting to make the fire bigger? Ah. <laughs> Because in real life, so, so two things. One, in real life, um, there isn't anything that a person wants um, to get bigger and bigger and bigger, infinitely so. That's not really how it works. In the love, what's really happening is, if we go into it a little bit, there is this idea he wants to put out the fire, right? Because in every feeling of closeness, there's two elements. There's how close you are and the sense that you, you should be closer. That, that there's like a, a, a thirst or a hunger element to the closeness. And so when the person's trying to get closer, what are they trying to put out? What are they trying to get rid of? The need, need to get closer. The need to get closer. But does it actually get rid of the need? No. It just makes it worse, right? Imagine eating food that always made you hungrier. Right. Mm. But the only way to get rid of your hunger is to eat more food. But there's no fit, that's not how life works physically, but that's actually how, right, if you, if that's what, in that analogy of using the gas and you put out the fire, the person thinks they're going to get rid of the, the fire, the, 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 the need to get rid of the fire is the need to be closer, meaning that the closeness I feel has an element of lacking of a deeper closeness. And I think I can get rid of that void, that lacking, 
by getting closer. But when you get closer, now you just have a sense of how much closer you really need to be. And so again, if nothing comes and interferes with that process. Now, I want to point out this is irrational. And by irrational, I mean in the sense that like an economist would say. If you, sometimes you're like not sure what to do when someone says, why don't you make a list of like pros and cons and decides what's like the most effective thing to do to meet your goals. Can you have the experience of ahaba, of love, if you are in that mindset? No, right? Because, because does it make sense to invest your resources, whether they're financial, time, which is obviously more important because you have a limited amount of that, emotional, your soul, into something that is never going to be fulfilled. Like if you're standing from the outside, like is that a wor- is that a worthwhile endeavor? No. no, but if you're in it, right, you get caught up in it. Make sense? Mm-hmm. Right. So if I'm standing outside saying, should I like, I want to invest in loving this person. Like, you're you're not going to go from outside to inside that way and saying, well, I've decided that that, that it's a good use of my efforts. If you decided that it's because you don't know what love is, or you're not really making a rational decision. Because if you really are in a, are loving, what's going to happen? It's using a financial analogy. It's like a Ponzi scheme. You know how Ponzi scheme works. So I, I I tell you I have a business, and I say, why don't you invest in my business? I don't have a business, so you give me a hundred dollars. Now I tell someone else I have a business. And they give me a hundred dollars. Now I use their hundred dollars to give you your returns and your investment. Your ten. So now I have a hundred and ninety dollars, and you have ten dollars. Right? Now I need to find someone else to give me $100. And now I give, next year I give a hundred and, I give $10 to you and $10 to them. Right? So now I have $270. I'm making a lot of money doing nothing. This is That's great. Very smart. This is very smart. Until what happens? <laughs> people, what happens when you stop finding people to give you money? You have no money. Because right? you're not actually doing anything that generates money. Right? You're not doing anything that provides people service. It's all built on a lot. Right? It, it, it's not, there, there's, and that's in a very negative sense, but there is a way in which that Ava has this quality that you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be fulfilled in love. So if you're looking for fulfillment, love is not a good option. Well, okay. Yeah. What's the other option? Other option? I don't know. But love is not it. Whether you can ever be fulfilled is a good question, but love is definitely not the, the way to get fulfillment. And I'm, I'm using that word quite in its literal meaning, like the idea of like, fulfilled, like completed, Mm -hmm. right? Because the more you love, the more you feel like you're lacking in closest and you need more of it. So then is it good not to love? Well, I believe there is a famous Gentile aphorism which Chassidus would probably agree with, at least in principle, that it's better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all. (laughs) In other words, there is something very, very tragic about a person who doesn't have love. But, you're, but, but a person who's very calculating, very rational, it's, it's very hard to come to love. Mm. Okay, now, we have a pseudo sense of this when we have like in our animalistic urges and desires, but as we know, if we're, if we're self-aware and we pay attention, those burn themselves out, right? Then they come back. That's not really love. How do you like, if they're not born into it, how do you get into a love situation? What? I just said you can't. No, I didn't say you can't get. You can't. I didn't say you can't get into love. I just said you can't get in it by being calculating and rational. That's all. Like if a person decides, mm-hmm. well, I've decided it's a good. It's, this is a good life option. This is how I'm going to get what I like. I have this other thing I want, and the best way to get it is through love. Like that's not. You might think about love and realize that like there's something fundamentally lacking in life if you don't if you don't have loving connections with people and like therefore try to love people. That, that it can be its own thing. But it can't be a means to some other kind of fulfillment. Is there such thing as love at first sight? I don't know. I mean, I do know, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, I'm just curious. Now, <laughs> the... the <laughs> so, now, why can't love be selfish? Because that's what it's starting from. Why can't love be selfish? Why can't love be selfish? Because it's not a selfish act. It's not an act. It's a feeling, right? Given what I said, why can't love be selfish? It's very simple. Let's say someone loves you. That means they feel close to you and they want to be closer still. And they do, th- and then because of that, they do things to get closer. And as they get closer, they feel closer, which makes them just feel they need to be even closer still, right? Okay, now, that's, right, that's 
from the perspective of the love er. Now let's talk about the beloved. You're someone loves you. And you feel like they prioritize themselves over you. You feel like you're being used. You feel like you're being taken advantage of. You feel like you're being objectified. Do you feel like there's closeness between you? No. Okay. What do we call it when someone is convinced of a reality delusional. that's not the way reality is? Delusional, right? Mm-hmm. Now, you're deluded, right? Yeah. Right. So if you feel close to somebody, but they're right, closeness is by definite has an element of mutuality to it, right? Right. Just like physically speaking, just like physically speaking, if 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 the cup is close to the pitcher, the pitcher is close to the cup. Yeah. yeah. If two people are close to each other, yeah. If if, if Reuven is close to Shimon, Shimon is also close to Reuven. Now, unlike a physical thing, there's going there can be differences in how that's experienced and what that looks like. Okay. Um, and I'm not getting into the fact that necessarily everything is people are consciously aware of everything. So you take the example of like an infant. An infant can feel love even though they have no conscious awareness of it. Right? This is why there's, a, God forbid, when infants aren't loved, bad things can happen. It's something called failure to thrive. But setting that aside. So if you were to be more aware of the way someone feels towards you and relates to you and feel more alienated, estranged, objectified, taken advantage of, etc., 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 right? You would say this is a sign that there's a lack of closeness between you, right? right? So if what I desire is closeness with someone else, I clearly don't desire for them to have a sense that I am using them, objectifying them, taking advantage of them, right? And that's, like, that's not what I'm after, right. right? So built into love because it's this unending pursuit of closeness is the notion that it can't be me prioritizing over them. In fact, if we think about it, what love is a never-ending pursuit of is the dissolving of the conflict between the lover and the beloved. In other words, like this. How do you know, when you get married, um, how do you know that you actually love each other? Do you? Maybe you don't. There are many ways. Here's one of the ways. Okay. Let's say you want something and your husband wants something else. Okay. How do you feel about that? That's true. Okay, why? Because they don't want what I want. <laughs> then you don't love them. Uh, that's crazy. <laughs> that's true. Why don't you feel frustrated that you don't want what they want? <laughs> because I never love them. Because <laughs> the deeper idea of really love, the deeper idea of really love is what you want is closeness. So what, what you, you want find to... frustrating is that you're not on the same page. Like it's not about... Like, right. it's fine if, if, if there's, you're, there's an almost indifference, like, like, if I want what you want or you want what I want, either is fine with me. What bothers me is that this notion that we're not on the same page. Right. Yes. Right? I, I don't want them to conform to me. And it's not about me conforming to them. It's like, why is there a me versus a them? Why is there myself versus the other? That's, that's, the, that's the antithesis of love. That makes sense? Yeah, I have a question. Just one second. Okay. If, if, you know, if, if, you, if, if you love somebody, you wanting it to be good for them and you wanting it to be good for yourself are in some sense the same thing. The more you love, those are the same. Because the more inseparable you feel you are with them. Which, by the way, carries its load of problems. I'm not saying love is the end all and be all of everything. Right. You have a question? Have a question. Yeah. Um, so when you're saying like we shouldn't be upset that they want something different, we should be upset that we're not on the same page. But you're not always going to be on the same page with someone. So the question: How to deal with that? I mean, I'm, emotions are one thing; practicality is another thing. By the way, you have an internal problems. So are there sometimes you want conflicting things? Yeah. Does that make your life difficult? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the notion but of internal oh, the notion of internal conflict makes your individual life difficult. If there's love, then internal conflict can exist. It's, it, you still you experience it as internal conflicts. Like one, one part of you, so to speak, is in conflict with another part of you. Because what, what's happening in love, this idea of closeness, is that the sense that we are two autonomous beings living our own lives, that's what's getting dissolved. That's what closeness really is. It's not that way. Okay? 
If you love somebody, okay, and things are good for them, to the degree that you love them, they're good for you. If you love someone and things are bad for them, to the degree to which you love someone, they're bad for you. It's loving like the unique aspects of someone, like we're not gonna get to them. We're, we're, we're gonna, I have one question. We're going gonna back, get to that later. Going back to Maybe. what you were just saying, though, about how you know if you love each other in marriage, does that also apply to any relationship where you can love someone, or just? Yes, marriage? but the reason why I mentioned marriage is because in marriage there are, there's often a level of liking and infatuation. It's not love. Okay, but like let's say like I love my mom, right? Right. But sometimes she doesn't agree with me on something, I don't agree with her on something. But it's not that I want to be on the same page, it's that I want her to agree with me. That's because you don't, it's because you're not, that, that, no, that, one second, one second, one second. Okay. So if we were to be very, very honest about this, what we say is like this, is that there's really, a com there's really a complex thing going on here. If we were to isolate your love for your mother only and pull that out, okay? and make that just a raw experience, then it would be like what I said. But because it's not a raw experience, it's, it's, it's mingled in with other things, like a need for autonomy and other things like that. So it doesn't always come out that way. So like if you were to take like an extreme scenario for a moment, um, where, where like, God forbid, like somebody's like child is lost, almost dies, or like the, 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 the parent has like a, a, a near death experience like that. And that moment of feeling really, really, really close, what you want is all the other stuff not to get in the way. That, that's very, very, very deep most of the time. Now, but that exists by virtue of the fact that she's your mother and you're her daughter. The reason why I use the example of, 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 of not, I didn't use the example of parents and children is because other loves are built. And so that's not a given that that's there. It's not true about friends. It's not true about so spouses. It parents. may develop to that. It may not. Okay. Is, it, is it given for parents? It is a given for parents. Now, you know, some people, like, how, how deeply it's buried is another discussion. Okay. Um, so, so, in other words, loving is not something that really happens in between two people. It's something that brings a unity. Right? It, it joins them. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. To put this in, 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 in another way, this is a, a little bit of a lower level of love. Are there things that you do not enjoy doing? Yes. Are, do you enjoy doing those things if you're doing them with other people? Yeah, more sometimes. More so. Sometimes, right? So, for instance, um, I do not enjoy going grocery shopping. Oh, I love grocery shopping. In fact, I don't enjoy going shopping for anything almost entirely, with like, the exception of books. Other than that, I don't really enjoy shopping, period. Okay. Now, what if I'm going shopping with my wife? Now, now, depending on all sorts of factors, but sometimes I actually enjoy going shopping with my wife. Why? Because you love her. Does she enjoys it? I don't even know if that she enjoys it. Because you're with her. Right, because it creates, it creates a, a scenario in which we can actually be interacting and spending time and maybe not having kids jumping all around us. Right? In other words, activities, when, when they involve those that we love, take on different meanings. It's not so much about the activity for what the activity is, but the way in which it allows that, act, that desire for closeness to be actualized in some kind of experience of togetherness. That make sense? That's why like, you can have like, grown, burly men really enjoy getting on the floor and playing dolls with their daughters. It's not because they enjoy playing dolls. Maybe. I mean, maybe, but that, that, <laughs> in the analogy, that's not what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Right, they, right, they, right, that sense of being close, that sense that we're together in this kind of shared just being together, right? And that's ultimately what's being sought out. So that's why there can't really be selfishness in love. Okay? Um, and that's why, again, left to its own devices, love is just you know, an ever-ending consuming force. There are downsides to love. For instance, it's very hard to respect other people's right to have their own opinions when you love them. Mm. Because separates that separates you, right? That's why parents have a very hard time when the fact that their children develop different values or lifestyles or opinions. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, now what would it mean, therefore, to love God?
It means you feel close to God, right? In such a way that you feel this urge to be closer that propels you to what? To do things that make you closer. And as you do those things that make you actually closer, what happens? Do you feel fulfilled? Mm-hmm. Or do you feel like you need to be even closer? closer? And if this keeps going without any interference, what's going to happen? It will consume your life, right? Mm-hmm. And what does that do to the way you relate to activities then? What makes activities more or less meaningful to you in as much as you love Hashem? It brings you closer to Hashem. What, right, whatever is bringing you closer to Hashem, more specifically those things that are act together activities right? things that are so to speak activities of being with Hashem would be the most meaningful things would it really matter what those activities are no okay now what activities do we do the way we are with Hashem which is a topic for a different class mitzvahs so a person loves Hashem what would be the most meaningful things in their life to do mitzvahs, mitzvahs. And when they do mitzvahs, do they feel fulfilled? Mm-hmm. No. 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 Because? There's more they can do. They want to be closer still. Right? And one of the ways we can explain it that a mitzvah leads to another mitzvah. Good? Mm-hmm. Okay. So now we've understood a little bit the idea of love. Now we're going to talk about specifically loving Hashem. And I said there's many, many ways of loving Hashem. We're going to focus on one of them. Okay. Um, before we do this, I would like to point something out, which is very, very important, but it is not the topic of the class, but I would be doing you a disservice if I don't point this out. What is a prerequisite for love as a general rule? It's not, it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not an absolute rule. But it's not love. Yeah. Which, which, well, just remember I said that love isn't selfish? Okay. If the way you relate to everything is in terms of yourself entirely, can you ever really love? No. No, right? Right? If if your worldview is I am the center and things have significance in as much as I find them useful or pleasurable or enjoyable, right? That's your kind of how you approach life. Then you can't really love other than whatever innate love is embedded in you by the, you know, parents to children things like that. Okay. Um, in English, we have the word respect. It carries many meanings. One of the meanings of respect is acknowledging that things have significance that has nothing to do with you. Mm. What does it mean to respect somebody? It means their life, their importance, their opinion is valuable, whether or not you have any connection to it. Matt, right? When you get married, is your husband going to be important? Yes. Yeah. Hopefully. Is he important because he's your husband? No. The answer is yes. Oh. But, but not because. But that is not, but, but that is the importance in love. He's important because you have this particular relationship. What's the importance of respect? That he's important? Even without you. Even without you. He, was, he, didn't be, he didn't all of a sudden like gain importance. He was like lacking any significance in his life. His life had no meaning. Whether he lived or died didn't matter. And then he became your husband. Like now his life has meaning. That's not true. Mm-hmm. Right? In other words, respecting others real, is, is, is actually a very, very profound thing. Because it means recognizing that actually reality does not center around you. Things have value and significance independent of you and outside of you. And if you think about it, it's really hard to figure out how one can come to genuine love and skip that. Right? Because mm-hmm. you're not, how can you be close to somebody if your whole relationship is, you, is that you don't value, you, you think that they have no value outside of you? I mean, we all think that we have some kind of value well, independent of others. they would be able to feel that with you right. because right. they would feel used. Right, they would feel used, right? Does so that make sense? So, so in a similar sense, there is an idea that we need to come to some sort of acknowledgement of God and the importance that God has independent of whether we love him or not prior to developing love of Hashem. And if we don't, we'll find that difficult, but that's not today's topic. I just want to make that clear that when one doesn't, for lack of words, have a certain respect for God as God, coming to love him is a bit of a daunting task. Okay, now let's get back to love. There are many, many, many types of love, and we're going to focus on the one that is arguably um, within the realm that Hasidus speaks about 
um, probably the most attainable. Now, by attainable, I mean two things. Attainable means you don't have it and you need to actually get it. So there, are, there are is a notion that deep down we have a love for Hashem, like say a child to a parent or things like that. But that's not attainable because you're not gaining it, right? You can discover it, you can tap into it. And then there's things that are, that are, are things that you need to gain, but they're, they're very, very difficult. So this is within the realm of things that we develop, that we attain, this is probably the most accessible of them all. And we'll preface with a verse. Um, the verse says that um, Hashem, speaking through Moshe, says, um, See, I have placed before you today as a chaim, as a mother, life and death. Sorry, sorry. As as a as a chaim, as a toy, life and good, as a mother, as a ra, death and evil. And then skip a few more verses to conclude the theme. Uvachart of chaim, and then God says you should choose life. So God says like this: I place two things in front of you. On this side you have life and good. On this side you have death and evil. And you should choose life. Simple enough? Okay. Who would choose death? Terrorists. Is the Torah addressing terrorists? <laughs> no, this is actually an important question. This is an important question. The Torah is not addressing terrorists. Why not? It doesn't address everyone? No. Only Jews? No. Um, no earthworms? Is there, is there, no, Torah does not address earthworms. It may speak about earthworms, it doesn't address earthworms. It addresses Jews. Um, what about the seven non I, I didn't say Jews or not Jews. The, the Torah, the Torah, the Torah, um, the Torah does not address wicked people as a general rule. The prophets talk to wicked people, but as a general rule, the Torah is not addressed to them. The Torah is generally addressed to somebody who is not going to, to turn their back on God just because they don't care. Not someone who's totally gone down the evil path. Um, and if you like read the Chumash, you can see it's, it's not really written. Like, to someone who's like standing in opposition to God, it's like, make me. Like, the Torah is not really written that way. Um, who in this room would choose death over life? That's the question that's more interesting. No one here would choose death? So what Hasidus says is that people misun- misunderstand what this verse is saying. They think the verse is saying that there's life, which is like when you're alive, and then there's death, when like, God forbid, the person like, you know, is dead. But if we think about it, what is death? Death is the separation of the body from the soul, right? Okay. Does the soul die? When it's separate no. from the body? Okay. No. What about the body? Yeah. yeah. The body dies, right? Okay, this is interesting. Why is it that when the soul is separate from the body, the soul lives on, but when the soul is separate from the body, the body dies? Why is that? Because God said so. Because God said so? No. Because the soul is a part of God. Yeah, yeah. This is true with Gentiles, by the way. And that notion of soul is part of God is specific to Jews. That's not, not relevant to today's class at all. The soul gives life to the body. The soul gives life to the body. That's a good one. The soul gives life to the body. It's like there's a rich man. He's handing the out like just, The body's just the vessel. What is life? I am. Deep question. It is a deep question. But if we're going to choose life versus death, I think we should have some sense of what life is, no? Okay. So we're going to start like this. Okay. It's a very deep life. question. What? Are you answering what's life? Maybe. We're going to start like this. Okay? Something that is true about life is that life doesn't die. Okay. Okay. Something, so, so this reason why the soul doesn't die is because the soul is living. Oh. A living thing does not die. Let's focus on people because if I do trees, I'm going to make people very sad. Are you as significant as, a, as bark? <laughs> 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 I 
Now, if living things don't die, so then let's think about the body now. The body's in living. It's the soul that's living, not the body. Is the, is the, it, the body's is the garment. The body, the body is not actually a living thing. The life of the soul is happening in the body and through the body. And in as much as that is the case, it is not wrong to describe the body as living. But it's not truly a living thing. In other words, like this. Different analogy, which is a little bit easier to understand. Oh, you have fire and the fire is hot. Is there any notion of heating up fire? Mm-mm. That, yeah. Like, how do you heat up fire? There's a way, I don't know. You blow it. Like You're not heating up the fire. No, but you the can fire, make a hotter fire. No, 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 fire can get hotter. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm asking you. That's not what I'm asking you. You're not heating up the fire. You can have a hotter fire and but a less hot up. fire. But you can heat, you heat it up. up. Like, well, you really? Yeah, you can heat yeah, like, it. That's not how it. <laughs> no, you can, no, you can heat. There's like certain stuff that you can add to it to increase the heat so that the burning is hot. I, I understand there's stuff you can add to increase the heat. But that's when what you, you just asked. How no. do you increase the heat of fire? No, I didn't say how you can increase the heat of fire. Okay? When you take, the, when you have a pot of water and you heat up the water, leaving microwaves out of this, what are you doing? <laughs> Boiling. You're taking something that is hot. Making it hotter. And no, you're taking something no. that is hot, like a fire. Making something else. And hot. the heat of the fire then radiates into the water, and in as much as that energy is there, the water is hot. hot. Then you take the water away, and what happens? That energy dissipates, and the water goes back to being cold. Mm-hmm. Right? That's not what you're doing when you make a hotter fire. Fire exists by consumption of fuel. Certain fuels burn hotter. Fine, great. So you can mess with the fire and make it hotter. I realize that. But you're not taking heat from one place and then bringing it to the fire and now the fire gets hotter. That's not how it works. You put it over a stove? What? You put it over a stove? What? The fire won't get that's hotter. That won't get hotter from that. What? No. That's the thing. That's the, thing. The, fire, the fire is not the kind of thing that receives heat from other things. It's hot. Now, it has its own conditions for how it exists. It needs to burn fuel and certain things burn very hot and certain things don't burn as hot and, you know, depending on... Um, you know, how much, how clean the combustion is, it can be burned hotter. And, but you're not taking heat from one place and bringing it to another. But when you heat up the water, that's what you're doing, right? You have heat in one place, and you're bringing it to another, right? Absent my question, not my question. Good? Make sense? Yeah. Okay. The soul is a living thing. It just, it, it, that, right? It's, it's living. That's what it is. Whatever life is. The body is not a living thing. What happens when there's a soul in the body? The living of the soul is happening in the body. But my body acts or like does things in a certain way when it's alive. That's right. But here's the important point. Here's the important point. The, the things that your body does when it's alive that are part of life, those have nothing to do with the body itself. Those have because everything of the to do soul. With, those are with the soul. In other words... If you would like to see a body for what a body really is, you take the soul out. Because if you want to see water for what water really is, you shouldn't look at a boiling pot of water. What should you look at? The river. Just look at the water on its own. If you're, it's true, if you heat up the water, it's going to boil. But boiling is not an intrinsic feature of water. Water's not always boiling. It depends if it's hot or not. If the, if the life of the soul is happening in the body, then the body will obviously be different. Like the heart. What about the heart? Like when the heart stops and the body stops, why is it the soul and not the heart? I didn't go into what life is yet. I just said it was one characteristic of life, which is that life is not life is not life is not the kind of thing that dies any more than fire cools down or gets heated. Wait, so now can I ask about a tree? No. What? So now can I ask about a tree? You want me to answer about a tree? I'll answer about a tree. Here's the thing. The life of a tree is not unique to that tree. So when the tree dies, meaning the life of the tree is separated from the tree, mm-hmm. there is no life of that tree. There's just the universal life of trees in general. They don't have the shell. They don't have their own unique life. Whereas when a person dies... Why would that make us upset? Well, if you're emotionally attached to a particular tree. Oh, well, I mean it's sad, but... Then what does that mean when the tree dies? What about an animal? Same thing. Mm-mm. <laughs> See? <Sorry. laughs> See, I warned you. 
In other words, there is a life to the animal, but the life of one dog and the life of another dog is only differentiated by the fact that they happen to be in different bodies at, at different times. They've Once they're out of the body, they've there's no distinct souls. <laughs> um, so so even they have different souls. Thing, it's then does the same thing yeah. apply to non-Jews? No, 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 non-Jews are people. They have different souls. <laughs> non-Jews are people. <laughs> Do you want me to answer that? Yeah. Okay. So they're not. Okay. okay. I can, this wasn't going to go into this, but if you want, I can answer this. Okay. What was the question? How does, how then are non-Jews different from like, oh, okay. Yang? Or, okay. 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 Very, very simple. What's this? It's on Spotify. cup. It's a cup. Okay. It's on Spotify. What's this? Another cup. This is also a cup. Okay. Now they're different because this is made of one piece of plastic, this is made of another piece of plastic. If we don't talk about the plastic, ignore the plastic. They're the same. Is there anything that makes one cup a distinct thing from another cup other than the plastic? No. Other than the plastic. Where it's been used. That has the oh. features of plastic. Dang. That's all about the physical plastic. In other words, if you're just talking about what a cup is in principle, there's no difference between this cup and this cup. Yeah, I agree. Okay. But what about a dog with like eyes and like... So. With the eyes. A brain. <laughs> <laughs> As eyes with dogs with are a body. Eyes. A brain a is a body. So here's the thing. When God creates things, okay, God creates things like people make cups and pictures and tables. First, he has the idea that there should be cups. And then there are cups. Okay, now the idea that there should, that God's idea that there should be cups, for lack of words, we'll call that the soul of the cup. Then God goes and makes a bunch of cups. What differentiates one cup from the other cup? Nothing. The plastic, right? On the level of the idea of the cup, there's no difference. What differentiates one table from another table if we're not talking about the actual physical features of the table? Nothing. Nothing. So, what is the soul of a dog? But one dog what is the... I, I realize that. What, do, what, what is the soul of a dog? God's idea of what a dog is supposed to be. Now, when God makes dogs... He puts some dogs in big bodies and some dogs in little bodies. You can make big cups and small cups. He it's puts, cute. right? But the thing is, what differentiates all of them has to do with the features of the bodies. Where they are, how big they are, how temperamental they are. All of those differentiations exist because they are talking about different bodies. Once you take the body out of the picture, there's just one. But what about like different personalities? Yeah. Let me finish. Those are all variations on, a, on the fundamental theme of what a dog is. What makes a person different is a person's created in the image of God, okay? It's on the That's not unique to Jews. A person made in the image of God. What does that mean? What's the purpose of a cup? To drink. What's the purpose of a knife? The cup. Okay? In other words, they have a defining quality to them, yes? What is the defining quality of a dog? Don't answer. You don't know. I don't know. But when God created dogs, he, he had an idea. This is the defining quality of what a dog is all about. When God made cows, he had an idea of what a cow is all about. When God made trees, he had an idea of what a tree is all about. Yeah? Okay. What is the defining quality of God? We don't know. We don't have a defining quality. Wrong one. God. What is the defining quality of God? God. He doesn't have one. Yeah, didn't I just say? Yeah, I do too. I thought you said we don't have one. Oh, no. He doesn't. He doesn't have one. Okay? <laughs> to put this in other words, to put this in other words, God has a self that isn't defined by anything. A notion of I that doesn't have to be followed by a definition. Okay? When God creates people, what does, what does that mean? That they're creating his image. They I also... Therefore, if what defines one dog is its dogness in the divine mind. And what defines the other dog is its dogness in the divine mind. And the only thing that separates them is their bodies. When you take the bodies away, there's no difference between them. But even if we were to be identical in every discernible feature, what makes me distinct from you is not because of my body, it's not because of different features, because my sense of my own being is different than yours. And that feature of the soul only exists in the soul of people because they're made in the image of God. And absent that, then it'd be true by people also. Yes. But are we all the same non-defining factor of the universe? But the thing is, the thing is, the thing is, now you're playing a word game. When you say non-defining factor, it's not that we're a category of non-defining things. It's what if we want to use language like this, yeah? 
Okay. What is it that I possess that makes me different from you? You could say a lot of things, right? But anything you say means that in principle, if we were to ha not have, I would not have that, or you were to have that, then I wouldn't be different from you, right? Which would be fundamentally the same, right? The notion of not having a defined self means, no, 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 no. What makes me different from you, it doesn't work though. What makes me different from you is that my sense of me is mine and your sense of you is yours. This relates to the idea of having free will, this idea that the soul is not defined in terms of the body at all. So what ends up happening is that when an animal or a plant dies, you just have the, the, the universal soul of that particular kind of plant or animal left. When a person dies, so we get from God, it's like how God's definition is so unique to him. It's not a definition. God has a self that doesn't need to have a definition. It doesn't need to find in terms of other things. Right. Yeah. Anyway, this was not really the point I wanted to get into. But Anyway, so when a person's alive, they are living through their body. And as much as living through their body, the body has to, so to speak, participate in that, right? Okay. Now, what are some of the qualities of life? other than the fact that life doesn't die. Movement. Movement, right? Okay, when things move on their own accord. I didn't say, I didn't say that if you don't move, you're not alive. I just said that that's a quality of life. So in fact, if a person is paralyzed, what do we conclude? We conclude there's something wrong with their body because they should be able to. Okay, now. Um, what are other qualities of life? Growth. Okay. Now, I don't like movement. I don't like growth. You know why? These are correct, but you know why? The significant. What is what is movement? The body is one place. Now it's another place. What's growth? The body was smaller. Now it's bigger. Notice there's some terms of the body. Yeah. Uh, uh, what does that mean? Personal growth? Mm -hmm. It means something different for you. No, but it has maybe to mean something. Like maybe, 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 something. Well, maybe spiritual, but maybe like finding like being comfortable with yourself. Being comfortable with yourself. Okay, now, so, so leave out spiritual Coming comfortable, right? A notion of being at comfortable with yourself, at peace with yourself, right? Can rocks be at peace with themselves? No, they're not alive. That's right. So, right? So being at peace with yourself, okay? How about some other things? Um, having things that you value, right? things that you think are, are truly important and meaningful, okay? Those are qualities of life, right? Having um, attachments, like let's say you have a very, very close friend and you haven't spoken to a friend in a long time, but you still feel very connected to them Right? You feel this lack that you don't know what's happening with them, as if your life is incomplete, right? So, there's, there's, so if you think about it like this, yeah? There's a lot of aspects of life that we can say, okay, that's because of the soul, but really we're just describing things in the body. So you're talking about like the body can move, or the body gets bigger, or the body repairs itself. That's all true, that's because of the soul. But those are, those are how the, those are, facets of how life plays out in the body, it's not really more, it's not getting at what life really is. Life really is things like you're saying, like feeling comfortable with yourself, value, meaning, attachment, okay? What about other things? Um, is love do you like, part of it? Love would be part of it. What about beauty? No. That's physical. It's physical? What is beauty? What no? No, I'm asking you. you what, what is beauty? I guess Pretend I don't know what beauty is. I'm dumb. I've never encountered the concept before. You explain to me what beauty is from scratch. Go for it. Now I think it is something. It's, it's an appreciation for something. It's an appreciation for something. You can appreciate something based on how it looks. Based on how it looks. Oh, it can also be like I know, like yeah. When you when you encounter something beautiful, 
things. Like when I counter a wall, like I can't go through it, right? That I understand. When I counter water, like I can swim. What happens when I counter this thing you call beauty? I've never it's not anymore. tangible. It's not tangible. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced that we're talking about physical, but continue. So what does it mean to encounter beauty? What is that? Do I run away and get scared because I encounter beauty? No. You're in awe. You're in awe. Okay. Mm -hmm. This doesn't sound like a very physical thing that we're talking about, does it? Um, would you like to live and continue to exist and never encounter beauty again? It seems like beauty and the but place of beauty. Like what? But people place such a physical thing on you, like all of like societal pressures and what it means to be beautiful and all this stuff. Like that's. Well, let me ask you a question. Are we are we using the same word for beauty now? Well, that's the thing. There's different. Uh, here's the thing. Here's the thing. When I started asking about beauty, you started moving in a particular direction, right? But now, if society has decided that everyone has to look a certain way in order to be accepted within society, is that really the same thing as beauty? No, it's a misconstrued. Right. In other words, like this, if everyone in society decides, right, that to wear like a green sash, right, is beautiful, does that mean when I encounter some of the green sash, I'm like, I feel the sense of like awe and enchantment because of that? No. And if society has all decided that there's nothing beautiful about the Grand Canyon, you're probably going to still feel like there's something beautiful about the Grand Canyon, right? So it's an interesting question to what degree that's malleable, right? But it's, it's not like, right? In other words, sometimes we, we, in other words, you can coarsen the idea so almost remove the whole soul of the matter, right? What about justice? What is justice? What is justice? Like people getting what they deserve. What they deserve. Where is, what's, what does this mean, deservedness? What is this? It's made up. It's made up? Really? No, based on what's how that, you what's act. What's that, what's that? No, I'm not asking you what you deserve. The very notion of deserving at all. Yeah. It's made up. Do you know what's made up? I don't know. I'll give you an example of something that's made up. Okay. Have you ever heard of the Looney Tunes? Yeah. They're made up. True. Are there cultures that don't have the Looney Tunes? Yeah. Could a person live like, like a full them. rich life with never having any Looney Tunes? Yeah. Have you ever encountered a person who's like, yeah, justice, the notion of deserving. It's like, nah. It's like, it's well, like, like the Looney Tunes. You can Tunes. live a life without ever needing to engage with justice. Really? I don't know. Really? <laughs> you met somebody like that? But like personally? Yeah. I've never like gotten retribution for something. I'm asking you justice at all in any sense. Like there's no need for any justice at all. It's fair. Really? Like it's you fair walk into the room. Well, is, if we said justice about what you deserve, about the notion of people getting what they deserve. Well, how do you know what people deserve? That's a separate question. I'm not asking whether, you, whether your apprehension of, of, of exact the specifics, I'm just asking on the very basic level. If you walk in the room and, and there's 10 cookies and one person takes nine. They're gonna get what they deserve. <laughs> you see, like, like, tell me the person's like, to call, nah, 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 nah. Like, like, no, there's something very deep, like, like, right? It eats away at you. What if you act in a way that on some level you know is unjust as a person? What does that do to you? If you're feel bad. What? Some people don't feel that. No, they don't. That's very, very rare, actually. Very, 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 very rare. Really? Really. Really. Even on the small scale? I said if you, if you, it, it, here's the thing. The smaller something is, the easier it is to, yeah, to some spin it. Yeah, not feel bad for eating that good That's, that's really right, bad. but, but usually, <laughs> that's why I said, if you do something that you know is wrong, right. you shouldn't have done. It does eat away. Yeah. So, like you start like fleshing out like there's these things that like this is what life is life is it's feeling comfortable with yourself there's meaning there's beauty there's justice right like if you think about it someone says hey, you want to live a good life what does that mean you want a lot of cars it depends on the person no pretend it doesn't depend on the person do you want a lot of cars no no one wants a lot of cars but a car person no they don't this is a lot they don't want a lot of cars what do they want? One really the attention thing. from the cars. They really want the attention from the cars? What are they trying to get with the attention? Uh, what if they enjoy it? Like, I know what they enjoy. I want you to think. See, so the problem is you can't love God if you take everything at face value. They're trying to feel something. Like they're trying to feel something. What are they trying to feel? Avoid themselves. Okay, so they want to feel whole? Yeah. Okay, they want, they want, right? So people want to feel whole with themselves. They want attachment. 
They want meaning, they want beauty, they want justice and fairness. We haven't spoken about purpose, they want to be needed, right? That's another thing, right? The cars are not of any real value. Now, maybe through the cars you get it, and maybe you don't, and maybe you think you're getting it, you're not really getting it, and then you discover that and have a midlife crisis, I don't know, right? But think about a person at the end of their life, and they're like, oh, I'm so glad that I had a lot of cars. Nobody says that. I'm so glad that I, that I had friends. I'm so glad that I was of service. I'm so glad that I was honest. I'm so glad that I saw the beautiful things in the world. You see what I'm saying? Like, like life is actually, if you think about it, life is, life, we, we live through the body and the body, if it's functional, probably enables us to live. But life has really nothing to do with physicality per se. And, if, we're, and if, we're, if we think deeply about it, we realize a lot of times we're pursuing the body and the physical things at the expense of life. Let's say you want to feel whole, right? Is getting a lot of likes on Instagram ever going to make you feel whole? Do people spend a lot of time chasing likes on Instagram? So they're choosing death. Choosing death means choosing the things that don't pertain to actual life itself. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? We're avoiding we, what we what? Do we have a false perception? Of we have perception? false perceptions. This is why it's important to develop a sense of reality, not to be deluded and to grow up and mature. This is what it means to choose life. Do you want to have a lot of money? Yeah. Then you need to grow up. I don't have enough. Really? What if you have no money? Would that be so bad? Yeah. Pay for food. Pay for that, Why do you need to pay for the food? What if someone provides the food? Oh, that's fine. Okay, so you don't need any money. Like that. Like, it, it, nothing like this. Let's be very, very honest, right? Like, really, be honest. Like, is it that important that the that, that is it that important that the salary comes out of the company, enters your bank account, and then enters the grocery store's bank account, and then they give you the food? It's really that order is really important. Or what's important is that you have the food. I have food. Okay, why? Why is it important that you have food? To eat. And why is it important to eat? No. So if someone put you in a cage and gave you food for the rest of your existence, that would be good? No. Okay. But food's not the only thing. Well, here's the thing. Um, what if, what if you could, what, if, what? If we didn't have money, we wouldn't be able to be here. But here's the thing is, this is exactly what choosing life is choosing. You, you're, you, what you're doing is, is, we all do this, you're not unique in this problem, is we conflate the way we get something with the thing we're trying to really get. Can you say that again? You're conflating the, th the way we get something with the thing we're trying to get. It is true that you had money and you used the money to pay for an airplane ticket that got you here, right? Okay. Yeah. But if someone else had paid for the ticket, or airplanes were like, you know, the entire world worked in a totally different way, and airplanes were like GPS. They were so, you know, cost, they were so cheap that basically they were free service. Mm -hmm. Would it bother you that you didn't have money to pay for the airplane yeah. ticket? No, because you don't really value money. In fact, if you could teleport here, would it bother you you didn't have a plane ticket? No. Right? In fact, if you would wake up every day feeling <coughs> refreshed and rejuvenated and ready to, to, to engage life, to, you know, to, to have authenticity, to feel connected, to be of service, to feel needed, to be at peace with yourself, to, to appreciate the beauty in the world around you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you didn't need to put like dead plants and animals into your mouth. Would that be so bad? I mean, you can't, but let's just say theoretically you could. Would that be so bad? Like it's really important to you to be able to put dead plants and animals into your mouth and chew them into, into paste? I do. That's what eating is. It's fun, a value. No. <laughs> fun, fun, fun is like Pavlo's dogs. You know Pavlo's dogs? Yeah. Right? They, they ring the bell and then the food comes, so they start salivating, right? That's what fun is. But why can't we admit that? Like, I can't honestly admit that. I'm, I want to get rid of that. What? I can't, with all, like, the understanding that what true life is, I still don't have the maturity to say that. That's what I want. I know. Like, that's hard. Yeah. You have to work on that. I don't want to. Okay. That's why God <laughs> says it's a choice. He's placed it in front of you. You can choose death. He didn't say you can't choose death. It's like, you know what? Death is kind of good. It's comfortable. It's not too hard. You know? It's fun. It's fun. Right? 
it gives it, you get enough vicarious senses of life of things that you can trick yourself into feeling this right. But eventually, you know, either people mature or they take a lot of drugs or they die. One of the three. Or they just had enough life. That's what I meant by a lot of drugs. Right. In other words, one of three things happens long term: is either a person matures, or they have to numb themselves, or they die. I mean, if you want to take the long route, you're, God says you're welcome to do so. I'm giving you advice to choose the life. Okay? So here's the thing, yeah? It's not a fair choice. It doesn't matter if it's a fair choice. Life's not fair. It doesn't mean they need to be two equal things. No, it doesn't. Okay. Now, let's go a step further. Yeah? If someone gives you a gift, what do you really want? Out of that gift, happiness, connection. No, you don't actually. This is a, this is like a very important thing. You don't want happiness. Why? I'll prove it to you. Okay. Let's say, let's say something all of a sudden goes horribly wrong. It's a thought experiment, and you wake up the next morning, and when you see your best friend fall and trip, it makes you happy. Mm. <laughs> right? And when. Um, People insult you, it makes you happy. And when your mother says you're not welcome home, it makes you happy. Oh, like, like at some point you start saying, like, wait a minute, there's something off, right? Yeah, you lost me. Because, because the thing is, happiness is supposed to, is a signal that things are in tune the way they're supposed to be. But if you know that something is very off and you feel happy about it. But why would you feel happy? Because something's broken inside of you. Okay. So which means hap- this happiness is a, is a signal of something else. And if that signal is misaligned, it doesn't work. Oh, so you're like receiving happiness because of Right. You always receive happiness because of something else. And the thing is, if you start to realize that what you're receiving happiness is not the kind of thing that you should be pursuing, not the kind of like thing that's... Like the gift. You're happy that they thought of you. Ah, so what, so what you don't want is... What you, what's the name of this? Is you want them to have actually thought of you. You want to be valued. Right? And because that's a real thing, when it happens, you feel happy. But if you got that, if you got the happiness without that, that would feel like, I mean, that's going back like the drugs, right? You don't know what, what about so. being unhappy about a gift you didn't want? Like, you get a gift that you don't didn't want. You I mean, there's, there's actually a deep maturity, people, of, 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 of feeling good that you're pained by things that should be painful. If someone does something to you, let's say somebody makes a public mockery of you, and you don't feel hurt, what does that say about you? You don't feel close to me. It means you, no, nothing, no, they made a public, it means there's something very wrong with you. We're social creatures, we have a deep need to belong. You should be embarrassed. If you don't feel embarrassed, then something is deeply wrong with you, right? And if you're aware of that, that should bother you, right? And if you know that, the fact that you feel a certain kind of discomfort you can actually take comfort in that because, oh, that means that like, I'm, I'm normal, I'm healthy, I'm like, that's the way I'm supposed to be. Right? You're supposed to cry at a funeral and, and rejoice at a wedding, not the other way around. Mm-hmm. Abstracting the, the, the hedonistic element of I enjoying this as a thing in itself is like, it's, it's, this, it, it's a lie and it's disastrous and nobody really thinks it's true when they actually implement it in their life. Okay, so now when you're a little kid and you get a gift, the gift is really, really important, right? As you mature, what's really important is the note, is the thought that went into it, is the intention, right? If you're really mature and someone really wanted to give you a gift, but they genuinely couldn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. This is called choosing life. Make sense? Okay. Is this easy? This happens automatically? No. no. And so you're going to start to think of what are all the things that really, like, not the way I get it. What is the <coughs> thing that, like, this itself, this is something that pertains to my living, to my life itself. Something that, in other words, is, touches the soul, pertains to the soul. Movement is not really that. Movement is useful because it gets me from here to there. Growing enables me to do more stuff. But why should I be somewhere else? Why should I be able to do stuff? Oh, because those things are meaningful. Those things give purpose. Those things are beautiful. There's a sense of justice. There's a sense of being whole with myself. Oh, so that's what I really want. That's what I really desire. Okay, yeah? And when you feel that in relation to someone else, 
then how do you feel towards them? You want to be closer to them, right? If you feel more whole, you feel there's more beauty when you're with this person. You feel that they, right, they, 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 they resonate with you on one of these levels. That's how you develop love with someone. Again, I'm not talking about the love of parents to children. That's a good thing. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yes. Okay, good. Now I can ask a question. So, <clears throat> if it just like keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, like in this cycle, and both people are like in that, how is there not a s- situation where it becomes like you burn each other out? Well, first off, who says that doesn't happen? No, but <laughs> that's number does one. Does that mean that you? Is it a case of that means you both really love each other or and everyone else doesn't? Or, like, how does that... The thing is, people are not just love. So there's a separate question of how do you integrate love with respect? How do you integrate love with compassion? How do you integrate great love with, with others? Right? And so the, you simp- simply love on its own has problems. Anything on its own is going to have problems. But we're just talking about love on itself, okay? Mm-hmm. I'm going to give you a different analogy now. I'm drinking this water, right? On a very simplistic level. What do I want in the water? Forget all the stuff I said before. What do I want? I'm drinking water. What? Hydration? Feeling? I'm like... The feeling of being refreshed. The feeling of being refreshed. That's that's why people drink water. They want the feeling of being refreshed. Proof being that anything that they feel is going to refresh them, they'll drink, even if it's a substitute for water, right? Maybe on a biological level, what I need is hydration. That's not how we're thinking, right? Now, what is water made of? H2O. H2O. Do I have a desire for H2O? No. What do I have a desire for? Water. I have a desire for that refreshingness that the water gives, right? It happens to be that the water in reality is made of H2O, but I'm not going to care for the H2O, right? If, if that same refreshingness came with, I don't know, um, you know, what's um, CO3, it would be fine with that, right? Not really. Why? People don't want other stuff in their water. That's because they learn stuff. They don't learn that. <laughs> now think about it, right? If someone gave you something to drink and it was refreshing, do you re- would you really care on the basic human level of what the chemical composition was? No. No, right? Right, I was going to drink so long. Right? See what I mean? Like, <laughs> I don't do you know how much it. sugar is in Coca Cola? No, I didn't. Okay, but diet. Do you know what diet is? <laughs> okay, fine. Is the, is the point clear? Yeah. Okay, so here's the thing. Where is God in this whole picture? I mean, this was supposed to be about loving God. So here's the problem. God, I love, let's present, I really want the refreshingness of the water, right? Where's God? Well, God made the water, right? Yeah. Now, do I really care about the H2O or I care about the refreshingness? Right? The H2O is a technicality. So if God made the H2O, then he's just like a technicality of a technicality. Right. Now, is if... Is like blasphemous to think? No, it's just no. pointing out an important thing that people actually are... Could you... Could you... Anyone here like, um, like ice cream? Yeah. Could you have ice cream if no one invented ice cream? No. No, right? That, that wouldn't happen, right? That. Wouldn't exist, right? So, who invented ice cream? No, I'm sure. Who invented ice cream? Which person invented ice cream? I don't care. Exactly. You don't care. <laughs> That's exactly right. You don't care. You want to hear an even deeper, more disturbing thing? You know who your parents are, hopefully, right? Most of us do. Grandparents, usually. Great grandparents? It's getting fuzzy. Great great grandparents. What were their names? Now, here's the interesting question. Before I brought that up, did you even care? No. <laughs> now, they literally are responsible in the causal sense for your existence. Like, okay, there's a bunch of people in Europe or North Africa and they had families and the end result is there's me. Like, fine, whatever. <laughs> the, the, fact that, the fact that you depend on something for what you want doesn't give you any emotional attachment to that. I don't have emotionally attached to the H2O because I want to be refreshed. I'm not emotionally attached to the guy who invented ice cream because I love ice cream. And I'm not emotionally attached, unfortunately, to my far past ancestors just because biologically they needed to mate in order for me to come into existence. 
Now, if you take that, you're seeing a problem with loving God. You might love all the stuff God gave you. It doesn't mean right. that you love God. It's like, very nice, God, thank you. And if you could do it for free without like, the whole mitzvah obligation, that would be better. <laughs> so how do you go to loving God? That should not be Sunday's No. Do you know what love is? Do you know what beauty is? Do you know what fairness and justice is? Meaning, purpose, belonging, attachment. Do you know what those things are? Those are God. Now, are they the totality of God? No. Are they God, even, even are, they, are they God expressing himself in a pure form? No. They're God revealing himself in a very, very limited sense. So what is it that you love about life? You love the beauty in life? You love the belonging? You love the purpose? You love the meaning? Oh, so what you love is God. Yeah, yes. Yeah, but you just love God when God is like... Doing stuff for us. Not, no, 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 it's not doing stuff. This is the, no, what I'm saying. Like, beauty, meaning, like, that stuff is... That's not stuff he's doing. When, 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 you're, when your friend... No, he didn't create it. Oh. Beauty... When the sun shines through the cracks in the window... Did he not do that? One second. When the sun shines through the cracks in the window, right... Is the sunlight that shines through the cracks in the window, in, 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 the, in the wall, is that sunlight the sunlight on the other side? It's the same sunlight? Yeah. It's just coming through very small, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you like the sunlight that comes through the narrow cracks in the wall, what does that say? You like sunlight. sunlight. Now, granted, you're only counting the sunlight as, a narrow, as it comes through a narrow crack in the wall, but what you like is the sunlight, right? Yeah. What we call beauty, what we call meaning, what we call belonging, what we call being whole with ourselves, what we call attachment, what we call love, what we call respect, what we call fairness, what we call justice, what we call knowledge. You know what all that stuff actually is? It's God. It's God shining through cracks in existence. Do you know what suffering is? Do you know what emptiness is? Do you know what... It's the same thing. No. no. It's I... when... A it's when oh. he's not shining through in existence. Oh. So what is the only thing you really love? Oh. But do you realize that is what you love is God? No. no, you end up, and I end up, we all end up conflating what we love with the means by which we get it. Why does he only get attributed to the good parts? Yeah. Do you wear, uh, why are you asking that question? It's not, because... Because what? Because <laughs> you're going to say it's not fair and that is God. No, because you're not understanding. The reason why you're asking question is you're not understanding the point. I think I am. Do you have any friends? I think so. Okay. <laughs> you, is, it comfortable, is it comfortable to be around them when they're in a good mood and they're smiling? Is it comfortable to be around them when they're miserable? Why not? Don't you like them? Don't you love them? Don't you want to be with them? And so why don't, don't you want to be with them? What? Since I don't want to be with them, it's not as comfortable. Let me ask you a question. If your friend is utterly miserable, yeah, do you have to make a decision to spend time with them? No, you're there. Really? Yeah. You don't I'm feel that, your, right, that, what? If, if you're a really, really, really good friend, is about it. Not that I'm really, really, really good friends. Really good friends is, I'll explain to you in terms of what really, really good friends is. Not really good friends, just a friend. No. Like, you'd have to make a decision to be there. Because if you're not making a decision to be there, what's going to happen? Like, this is like, I've, I've like only a minute of time in life. This is not a pleasant experience. I'd rather be somewhere else. Now, you may still decide to stay there. I'm not saying you won't, right? Now, what if your friend is like, is in a good mood? Do you have to make a decision to be there? Or like, that's where you want to be? In as much as that you're there. You know what the difference is? What is it? Now, think about yourself. When you're in a really bad mood, when things are just miserable, be honest, do you feel like you're yourself? No. No. When you're in a good mood and things are really going the way that you want, and do you feel like you're yourself? No. Okay, so it turns out that when you're someone's friend, you want to be with them. And when they're miserable, they are not themselves. They're not being manifest. So and that's friend. Right? And they're not a parent. So it's not like you don't want to be around them. It's just they're not here. Now, if you're a really good friend, you sense that on some deeper level they are here and that's why you stay. And you want to stay, okay? 
So it's the same thing with God. It's, it, it, it's not a matter of like, we're not getting into a question of like explaining religion and why God created it. It's a very, very simple thing. There's reality that God created. And then there's the question, does God actually reveal himself? Does God actually show himself in our life, in our reality? And the answer is he does. And you know what that thing that he, when he shows himself, you know what we call that? Life, real life. And when, for whatever reason, he isn't showing himself, that's when it feels like life is really lacking. And the problem is, we actually conflate what we, what we really desire, what we really want, with the way we get it. I'll give you an example. Sometimes you might miss somebody. Like, dude, they're gone, you miss them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, it could be that, that, that you used to like, go out with that person and get coffee regularly. So when you miss the person, you might feel like you want to go get coffee. Do you really want coffee? No. No, what do you want? To be close to that You want to be that close to the person, right? Mm. Now, to be fair, if like going out and getting coffee, you're going out and you appreciate that this is nostalgic and it helps to bring back memories of that person, okay, that's maybe legitimate, right? But what happens if like that gets all like warped in your mind and you actually feel like you have like a genuine need for coffee? That's really being driven by the fact that you have this like deep, Nostalgia for this person that you're not able to see anymore, they passed away, whatever it is, right? You're just going to have serious problems, right? This is, in other words, the death thing is the fact that life is manifest in reality, and then we start thinking the things in reality are what we really want. So if you start to realize that, that like, so there's some of it's maturing, right? That, you know, certain things that are appealing, they're, they're, they're shallow, and I don't want them anymore. And then there's real life, and realizing the real life isn't isn't about the stuff. It's not about the body. It's not about the paint. When you go to the art museum and you want to see art, what do you want to see? Do you want to see paint? Do you want to see colors? Do you want to see beauty? Do you want to see creativity? Do you want to see emotion, right? That's what you want to see, right? So if a person starts to like, like, like realize, so this, what, I really, what I really want, what I really feel like is what I need to really, that my life should be lived, is not physical at all. It maybe happens through physical, it's not physical at all. And what is that thing? That is Hashem showing himself. So it turns out that if I, if what, I, what I have to do is I have to, I have to, I have to learn that what I really want isn't part of this reality. Not that it's not present in reality, it's just not part of reality. If you're in a dark room, right, and there's little cracks and the sunlight's just coming through and you really appreciate the sunlight, what you want is not part of the room. It's coming through the cracks into the room. Now, once you realize that and you really appreciate the little cracks of light in the room and you realize that you have a hatchet and you maybe can make bigger holes to have more light, would you take that hatchet and make bigger holes? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? So what if you have ways of making reality more receptive to God, more receptive to, to God's showing him a little glimmer of himself in life? If you, re, if you come to this realization, you're gonna to wanna to do that, right? And what happens when reality now is more receptive to God revealing a little glimmer of himself? Do you feel satisfied? Or do you feel like now you have a deeper sense of what life is, a deeper sense of what God is, and you want more. So now what do you need to do to reality? Open it up even more. That's this what. Seems, this seems to be saying that all, like things that like you need to be able to value. That's right. The things in order to have that relationship. What mm-hmm. if say mitzvahs that don't really you don't feel the. But the, where do the mitzvahs come in the, come in the picture? The, the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs are things that the mitzvahs are things we do to get closer to God. To open, right? In other words, to bring more closer. So mitzvahs refine ourselves, refine the world, and in this scheme of things. In other words, you're right. It doesn't start with the mitzvahs. But if mitzvahs are things that, that make the world more receptive to God and make us more receptive to God, so then those are things I'm going to want to do because what? They're going to bring more sense. And if you think about it, this is true with people, right? If you know, for instance, you know that you have a friend, and you know that particular friend really likes corny jokes. And you know they're going through a hard time. 
and you're not even being altruistic. You're just, you, you love them and you want to, like you really want to be together. And again, not in a selfish way. Like, it's not like they need time to process and you just want to have fun. That's selfish. It's like, they don't want to be stuck in that space. You don't want them to be stuck in that space. You want to be, they want to, they, they, you want to get back to that place of togetherness, right? But they're stuck there. And you know that they find corny jokes really, really fun. And they, they even though you don't. And so you get them like a, like a, a corny joke book and you wrap it in some sort of like, you know, corny wrapping paper from some sort of novelty gifts and you give it to them, right? And what happens as they crack a little smile, right? The, the eyes start to twinkle a little bit and then they come back to themselves, right? It's not, you don't need to like, because it wasn't about the thing. It's about how it opens up Right? And, and it could be the same thing, right? It could be there's things you can do, right? Some weeks we understand it's as opening the world up to God, opening ourselves up to be more refined. However, you, there's different ways of understanding that. But the bottom line is, are you desiring God? So mitzvahs are not a means to him. There's different ways of thinking about it. But what, the, what, what this would mean then is that, that if you, if a person is very debased, if a person is just kind of moving from one entertaining thing, one hedonistic drive to the next, are they ever going to be able to love God? Now, it's interesting, what's the first step in loving God? Is actually learning to value your life as life. If you sit down and make a simple calculation that you have a certain amount of time on this earth, what do you want to fill it with? Life. What is life? Connection. Being wanted. Being of service. Beauty fairness, integrity, being whole with yourself, right? Okay, so now then think, okay, so, so that's, that, but is that often how we engage our lives? Or if we say, you don't live in time on earth, what do you want, right? People will tell you, maybe not even shallow things, will say, I want to go here, I want to do this. If going there and doing this doesn't get you back to this place of life, is it really worth it? No. So step one is really to value life, and step two is realizing that what life really is, is not of this reality. It's something else coming into this reality. And that's a little faint glimmer of God. Like a little ray of sunlight coming in through a crack in a wall in a dark room. And if a person doesn't just take this as a nice idea, but actually reflects on it to change how they see their life and how they see reality, what's going to happen? What are they going to want? They're going to want to be closer to God. They're going to therefore do things that make that more the case. And when that happens, they're gonna to wanna to be closer to God. And this is gonna repeat, okay? And this is what the verse means when it says, love Hashem your God because he is your life. Not love Hashem because he gives you stuff. Nobody loves people because they give them stuff. Make sense? Is this easy? Is it attainable? It is attainable. Is it, is it, now from the perspective of Judaism, is this, an, is this an optional thing or is this required? What? It's required. It's required. It's a commandment to love God. <laughs> you have to keep Shabbos, you have to love God, right? They're both commandments. <laughs> so, good? Okay. One final point. If you love somebody, in a real way, and they do something that hurts you. It's a side issue, but even more. How do you react to that? You have more compassion. Mm-hmm. You get upset. You're what? Well, how hurt? I'll tell you the answer. In the light of your love. All your answers are in light of the love, right? Maybe you take it. Maybe you're more devastated. More, you more compassion. Maybe you justify, right? But in light of the love, right? Do you ever, if you love somebody and they hurt you, do you ever stand in kind of a dispassionate, objective way and come up with some sort of like right and wrong about it? No. So if someone is having this discussion about it, what God does is right and what God does is wrong, what does that indicate about that person? They don't love God. They don't love God. If a person's saying, I'm very angry with God because he hurt me and that was unfair and I feel betrayed by him, okay, they may have loved God, right? That's, that's possible, right? You see, this is very different. So it's just like another side point. When we say love God, we don't actually mean it as like a metaphor. We mean it really. Like when you love somebody. When you love somebody, what they do gets interpreted and moved through that lens, right? So that's another facet of love.
Have a wonderful day.